Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks so much for tuning in to the Common Good podcast. Uh, we're calling this the, the home edition. <laughs> Obviously, we are doing this virtually uh, via Zoom, uh, given the circumstances. Uh, but just so glad that uh, you're tuning in and, and joining with us uh, this morning. Uh, we realize that you know these are these are unprecedented times. Um, I don't think we've experienced anything quite like this. And I know there's so much fear. There's so much disruption. Um, there's so much uncertainty. And so um, our hope is that in the midst of this, um, as much as there is uh, uncertainty, that I think we can continue to be the church. And uh, I think it's in times of adversity and challenge, uh, honestly, that I think uh, this is where we get to see what the church is made out of. And I think, I think it's in times like this where uh, this is an opportunity for us as the church uh, to continue to be for the common good. And so uh, that's really what this podcast is all about, uh, where we get to have a conversation with uh, everyday, regular, ordinary people of faith who are using their their talents, their passions, their gifts, their time, their influence, uh, really for the common good. And uh, so that's really the hope is that as we have these conversations, uh, you'll be inspired, you'll be encouraged, uh, you'll be uh, challenged uh, to discover what does it look like for you to live into your own unique God-given purpose and calling uh, so that God might use you uh, to be a part of uh, working for the common good uh, of those, not just in our immediate communities, but those around us. And so uh, super, super excited uh, that you guys are, are joining in and, and tuned in today. Uh, today, uh, I'm pumped. We have on the podcast uh, the one and only Dr. Joshua Lau. So, hey, Dr. Josh, thanks so much for, uh, for being here for being on the show this morning. Glad to be here. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. As long as you don't call me Dr. Josh again. All right, yeah. I won't. I'll, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just call you Josh. I love it. Here on out. That's awesome. How you guys doing? I mean, uh, we haven't been able to actually do one of these for a while. So, uh, you have fam families hanging in there? You guys uh, doing okay? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I think, you know, just echo the thing you said, it's definitely unprecedented times, right? I mean, literally uh, once in a century. Um, global crisis that we're facing here. So nothing that really any of us that are alive have ever uh, seen. Uh, but thanks for asking about the family. You know, we're doing okay hanging in. Uh, it's a new normal. It's a different world. Um, trying as citizens, you know, to do our part in, you know, curtailing in-person social events, um, doing good hand washing, um, and, you know, really being mindful of the needs of people that live around us, uh, but hanging in. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, well, again, it's just an honor to, to have you uh, on the podcast. Um, you've been up, well, I think we've known each other for, gosh, has it, has it been almost a year now? I think it was almost this time last year that uh, we, we met and uh, I think we sat down, I don't know, at a coffee shop and started talking. And um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I, I was just so impressed. That first conversation, I, I don't know if I shared this with you, but I was like, man, this guy, this guy is way too smart. Um, and uh, as we were talking, I was like, man, this guy, like, I don't know how, I couldn't even keep track of how many degrees you have. Um, but I was like, what impressed me so much though, really honestly, just after that first time of just uh, sitting down and getting to know you and hearing your story, um, man, it was just your humility and your heart for God. And uh, just thinking about all the different uh, kind of roles and the hats that you wear, uh, obviously as um, a husband, uh, as a father, uh, now with two, two young ones. And uh, congratulations again, by the way. Your youngest is now s six months, seven months old? That's right, yeah, absolutely. Okay, wow, crazy. Um, so I was thinking about, I mean, husband, father, you're a theologian, um, a doctor, uh, you're, a, you're a researcher, so all, all these different things. And, uh, but I think the thing that, again, that, that just came away from that conversation is, uh, and I think what I've so appreciated just about uh, about our relationship and just the multiple times that we've been able to sit down, whether it's over coffee, over lunch, is uh, again, just your heart for God, your heart for the church. Um, I have, have just so appreciated just your insights and your wisdom and uh, the things that you share. So uh, it's been cool just to be on this journey with you and have you part of the common good family for sure. So that's awesome. Yeah. No, I, I um, you know, they say time flies, but I think thinking back, you're right. It's been that long, hard to believe. And uh, no, you, you're too kind. I think hopefully as we'll unpack here today together. Um, I think we're all just ordinary people in extraordinary times. And so um, blessed to have had the experience that I've had and, um, um, and, and glad to have, I'll just say it, glad the year, glad to have engaged with you and others over the course of a year now. 
That's awesome. Um, so I want to talk, well, first, I think for those that, that don't know you, um, I think it'd be awesome just to, for folks to kind of just hear a little bit about your story, uh, in particular about kind of what you do. And obviously that's kind of the focus of, uh, this common good podcast, right? Is, uh, specifically talking about and kind of unpacking how different people are utilizing their skills, their talents, their passions, their resources, uh, to influence uh, those around them and to work for the common good. And, uh, obviously I, I mentioned that you wear a lot of different hats, but I want to talk about your, your official title and I want to get it right. So I wrote it down. Um, I, I'll, I'll share it and then you can maybe explain it kind of more in layman's terms. Uh, sure. The rest of us that might not necessarily understand uh, yeah. what that means. Um, but your official title is you are a board certified internal medicine physician and the medical director of payment strategy at UW Medicine. So you're right here, you're local, you're in our own backyard. Um, you're also faculty for the Department of Medicine with the UW School of Medicine, and you're also on faculty for the Department of Health Services within the UW School of Public Health. So I don't know, in layman terms, this is what I tell like my family. I'm like, I met this, this, this doctor, but I think he's not like a normal doctor. <laughs> he's like, he's kind of, I don't know, a super doctor. Maybe just explain a little bit of, kind of what each of those different roles look like for you and kind of what that means. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the, maybe the most unified, easy way to think about the work, the couple hats that I wear is probably through um, the analogy that some people kind of draw from the, the river story. I don't know if you're familiar with that story, uh, but the, the story dates back to the 1930s. It's been told many different ways over time, but, but the core part of it is imagine you know, you and I are um, part of a group and we're standing by the river and we notice somebody that's in the river. They're falling in the river and they're kind of coming downstream and they're drowning. And so our first, of course, response is to jump in and save them and, uh, and, and then fight the current and rally and bring them back to shore. Unfortunately, we save that one person and we see the next one. There's another person. in, So we go back out and do it again and a third and a fourth. And so, um, you know, at some point, a dynamic occurs where you're able to save some and not able to save others. So the core part of the story is that one of the people in the group will get up and start walking upstream, just take the bank and go upstream. And another person will say, what are you doing? Where are you going? You know, the action's right here. And that person, the first person will say, um, yes, um, but I'm going to go upstream to figure out why are all these people falling in the water in the first place? And, and so that's really the concept right behind the story, the situation in which you have people who are in need, right, who are caught drowning in the river. Um, and part of the response has to be kind of a frontline, save the person right in front of you type of thing. Uh, but part of it should probably also be going upstream, right? In the context of the analogy would be maybe there's a footbridge, you know, that's chronically broken and it's very unstable. And so tons of people are falling in there. And if you could just fix that footbridge, block it off so people can't cross or fix it, make it more stable, you could prevent a lot of people, right? And so those two things at the same time really are at the heart of it. And that's the core intuition really of the story do downstream work, but also go upstream to fix those factors. Mm -hmm. And I say all that because I think really that, that helps kind of um, set the context for what I do. I'll add one wrinkle. This is the Josh addition to the story. So don't misquote this one, which is to say that, you know, part of the challenge of saving these people in the water is it, you know, the current's really strong, right? They're rapids, it's turbulent. And I think we often think about the turbulence of water as a fixed thing, right? Oh, there's a class five rapids river and there's a class two. And mm -hmm. Those are fixed. But actually, you know, those things are just functions of the structural issues around the water, right? A boulder or a tree that's under the water that creates rapids, right? The shape, the contour of the river, which is to say that when you go upstream, yeah, you could fix a footbridge, but you could also take a, a boulder out, right? Block off a dam, do certain things to the water such that, God forbid, someone falls in, you have an easier time saving them, right? And again, all of this is just to contextualize the work of upstream, downstream. Gotcha. So why do I say all that? I think, you know, I, I wear four hats and you can really think about them in that way. The first, of course, is patient care. And in that first hat, I take care of people who are hospitalized at the University of Washington and people who unfortunately are sick enough to really need hospital inpatient care. And I view that really as people who've fallen ill, who've fallen in the river, and you're trying to take care of them one by one. The second and third hats, you kind of mentioned them. One is an administrative um, uh, hat, and then the other is a research hat. Those I really think of as the upstream stuff. It's to go upstream and to use analysis and data to really figure out how are we delivering care to people? Um, how do we pay for that care? What maximizes people's outcomes? That type of thing. It's very think of the river, think of the bridges, structural type of stuff. Um, and so those are the second and third hats. And again, really to minimize the number of people we need to see. If I can prevent disease, if I can prevent someone from having to come to the hospital, I don't need to take care of them in the hospital. And that's great for everyone. Right. You know, and then the third, the fourth and final hat really is um, education. It's one I'm very passionate about. 
you know, I'm fortunate to uh, teach medical students, resident physicians at times, MBAs, PhDs, uh, Masters of Health Administration. And, and the, the goal there is very simple, right? It is to help them in their career. They're, they're building a career towards downstream take care of people mm -hmm. type of work, upstream research work, upstream administration work. The goal there is simply to give them a tailwind to impart whatever quote wisdom I have so that they can take the torch farther and longer than I could ever go, right? So those are the four hats, downstream patient care, upstream administration or research, uh, and some education. Yeah. So I don't know if that's normal or not, but that's, that's how I think about it. <laughs> that, that sounds like a lot. I mean, <laughs> what does that even, like, what does that look like on a day-to-day? -day? You're wearing like four different hats. Each of those sound like in and of itself, like a job by itself, um, like four full-time jobs. Like, how does that even work? There's only 24 hours in the day. Obviously, you're not even working 24 of those hours. Right. Uh, like, right. uh, what, it, what does the day in a life of, of Josh look like? Like, how does that kind of break down for you? Yeah, the days look like a lot of um, um, kind of the, probably the, the fifth hat is actually the, the management hat that I have to juggle between all of those hats, right? So there are certain days where I take care of patients. And when I take care of patients, I'm on for a week or two at a time. Um, and it's, it's all out. You know, it's 12 hour days, 14 hour days, uh, you're on all the time. Um, and then the days that I'm not on, I'm doing some of the other work right? Administration or research. In those days, you have to then actively manage your schedule as well, right? Um, for those uh, who have done research or who do administration, leadership, you know that the, the cadence of that work is different, right? And so, for instance, this when this COVID thing hit, mm -hmm. right, our leadership had to totally drop what they were doing and, and pivot, right? You could never have forecast that, right? right? Research is a little bit different. You can kind of plan a project and plan an analysis, but um, same things can happen, right? Um, a, a kind of timely newsworthy thing comes and you got to hustle to get your research out yeah. or you miss the boat. You say, this is really important. They go, look, we cared about it six months ago. We don't care anymore. Right. A bitter pill, but you have to deal with that. So it, it, the days I would say said simply is there is no normal day for me uh, yeah. because the days are really juggling all those things and thinking, okay, these two hours, I'm going to take this call then I'm going to take two hours and work on this research analysis. Then take a 30 minute call, meet that person, do a mentorship meeting, you know, check in on a patient that I took care of last week. And, and that kind of thing. And, and you're right that uh, you at some point then have to come back and do all the other things that are very important to you. Uh -huh. So no such thing as a normal day, but very busy. I'll say that. Yeah. Sounds like it. Um, so uh, you, you talked about COVID-19 and I want to get to that. Obviously uh, I think it's yeah. relevant to what we're going through right now as a community. Um, but uh, I'm curious, you know, this whole common, the, the whole common good podcast, right? This idea of what is it um, as, as faith people, uh, those of us who uh, prescribe to the label being a Christian, whatever you want to call it, a Jesus person. Um, you know, one of our convictions, obviously, as a church is that uh, we believe that Jesus is for the common good. He was for the common good. Therefore, as a church, we're to be for the common good. And uh, I'm curious for you. Uh, Kind of what is kind of your particular take and understanding of what does it mean to, to be for the common good? Um, and that, but in particular, how is that kind of shaped and informed like what you do on a day to day basis? It, it seems like the fact that you've chosen into kind of wearing these multiple different hats and um, they, they, they sound like they've they're very they've been done very intentionally. Um, so I'm just curious, like one kind of how do you understand common good? Two, how much of that has actually informed like some of these kind of vocational career decisions that you've made? Um, yeah. No, I think, um, you know, one of the, the great parts of being in a church capital C is that, um, you know, they're diff different, um, same house, different views type of thing. And so, uh, you know, I have a very specific view that I don't represent for other people perhaps, but you know, when I think of common good, I, I think of it in, in two in the very human ways, right? Kind of on, on one level, philosophically, it's a way that we engage with each other. So we engage in dialogue and discourse about, you know, it's a kind of a kindling for the fire of the conversation about why should we invest in this thing or do the other or not do that thing over there. Um, and it's fundamentally relational. This idea that what I do impacts you and what I don't do also impacts you and vice versa. Yeah. And that in different times, in different places, what we do has an outsized effect on a bunch of other people. Right. So that's the kind of the philosophical view. The kind of um, social political view would be that kind of the discourses around, you know, what are the facilities and the goods, right, um, that we can produce that actually benefit all other people. So let's make it very concrete. I, mm -hmm. I think of things like uh, road systems, public parks, libraries, civil liberties. Um, uh, police and safety, those types of things. Those are things that 
you know, not all of us go into putting those things, but when those things are created, they impact and can benefit all of us. At least that's the goal. And there's a wrinkle there, right? Which is that we can talk about the thing, the, the library, or we can talk about the thing behind the thing, which is education for all citizens, mm-hmm. right? And I view common good in all of that way. So um, it may be a roundabout way of saying, when I think of common good, I think of it as a kind of philosophical posture we have to other people around us mm-hmm. in where we talk about how we invest in things, goods, facilities, to get at those more conceptual but very important things, yeah. recognizing that our actions and our inactions all have um, impact on other people and vice versa. That's good. Right? And, and so I think so little of what we do um, in our work as professionals, as private citizens, as members of the church, uh, whatever, um, doesn't relate to that. So much of it relates to that. Um, you know, if you, when I think about what do I do that doesn't impact other people, not that many things, right? And certainly if you choose the line of work that I have chosen, uh, that's definitely the case. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Well, and then, because you talk specifically about this whole concept of going back to that river kind of illustration, right? And yeah. stream upstream. And so in a lot of ways, then, like you, as you see kind of the work of, of um, engaging the common good, um, the, the work that you're spe- specifically choosing into is to say, like, I want to do some work downstream, but I also want to go upstream to look at the systems and the things kind of uh, the infrastructure and the things that could be done better or recreated or restructured so that it would, you know, help hopefully minimize the number of people that are kind of downstream. Like in some ways I think about for a lot of us, I would think, well, just doing one of those kind of might, isn't that good enough? Like what for you was like, I want to do both. Um, like how do you get to that point? I mean, cause I think I, I even wrestle with that sometimes, right. Of like, okay, what does it look like to really help people and to, and to be for the common good? And I think there's this tension, right? Do I focus my time and energy downstream or do I go upstream and kind of look at the systems and the structures and to say, Hey, what could be fixed here? Um, I don't know too many people that are trying to like do both of those. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, I think in ultimately, uh, I think a person can have a great, fantastic, meaningful career in life doing one or the other. Yeah. Kind of thing. There's no value judgment here for me. Um, I, I would say that I just believe that you get synergy that one plus one is not two that if you do both, one plus one is four, right? Mm-hmm. Or three. Wow. Uh, and the reason is because I think, at least in my line of work, when you're taking care of a person, one person at a time, it's very meaningful. You get to lay hands on people. There's a person, that person has a name, has a family, has a story. Yeah. You can take nothing away from that. But at times it feels, when there's so many people in the water, you feel right. like, is this ever going to end? And is this the most rational way of doing this? And I'd say, I don't want to put words in any other doctor's mouths, but a lot of us, I think, have felt that at some point. You know, clinics are overflowing. You know, um, healthcare insurance is, is, is limited, it, it non-existent for people. You feel that. And the other side is also true. You get to think about pulling one policy lever, designing one thing, and it can impact hundreds, thousands tens of thousands of people. I mean, that is really meaningful. And yet both side, that side has a limitation also, right? That it, it becomes a little too abstract. You know, you um, start to think about people as like um, in the millions, you know, and like, you know, the public good, like what, what does that really mean? You know, there's no name to that. And so if you're not careful, you kind of float away. You want to leave reality in that way too. And so I think there are benefits on both sides. There are limitations on both sides. And the reason I think there's a synergy is that if you put it together in an intentional way, and, um, and, you know, you kind of, um, work hard to try to do it the best way and then give yourself over to providence or grace or chance or whatever you believe in, yeah. you can maximize the good and minimize the bad, which is to say that when I'm seeing an individual patient, the perspective that I have, because certain days I'm not seeing patients, I think I'd like to believe makes me a better um, clinician to be able to see those patients. Mm-hmm. Vice versa, when I'm sitting in a room and I know this for sure, when I'm talking to people with MBAs and, you know, people who are making policy you know, when I'm able to say, when I sit with people that are sick, this is what I see, this is what I feel, this is what it's like there in real life, it gives such a technical to, to the work yeah. um, that I would say, again, I could never say to any one person in their vocation, hey, do both of them. But if you're able to do both, it just gives, in my kind of specific opinion, such a, a vibrant perspective that I think gives synergy. One plus one can equal three. Right. And, you know, I have friends that have done it in different ways, you know. They're an artist. They also own a small artist collective. You know, um, there's so many ways to do this. 
Um, but I don't think it's limited to just what I do. Um, but that's probably the main reason why the synergy that comes from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so good. Um, well, and I think you, you bring, you raise a good point too, right. Of, of validating people and whatever they feel perhaps called to whatever, whatever they've given their life to. Yes. Uh, if you can do both fantastic, but at a minimum, right. It would seem like, well, that's also the value of like, when I think about certainly a church context, right. Being in the body of Christ of like being able to have a, a, a fuller breadth and understanding of what does it look like to really love and serve people and help people and work for the common good. And I think right. sometimes it's so easy to get siloed in our very particular vocation mm-hmm. or how we live it out or how we do it, but it's yes. recognizing the value that all of these things need to come together and, and hopefully we're working together um, to kind of see the greater good happen. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd make just one more analogy around clinical medicine, right? So um, some of some doctors are generalists, right? They know a little bit about a lot of things. They have deep, really a lot of breadth in what they know, right? And some doctors are sub, sub, sub specialists. They are, you know, pinky surgeons, you know, just the pinky or something. I'm it's a joke, but they're very specialized. And if you were to ask, well, which is better? That's the wrong question. Yeah. You know, they're just different. You need different people for different things, right? If you have one and not the other, it just doesn't work. And I think it applies back to the, the, the corporate body of uh, the church as well. Um, so I think it's really, really important to make that point. It is not good or bad or right or wrong. If you do the one or the other or both, um, I think the point is to always be thoughtful about which one you're doing to recognize what you're doing in relationship to other people. Um, and to whatever you're going to do, do it well. Yeah. So good. I love that. I love that. Hey, we got to talk about COVID-19 a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, now, I mean, I, maybe just to start, obviously there's so, there's, there's so much information so much misinformation. I mean, the news, literally every news headline that, that I read is, I feel like is on this topic. Yeah. And, uh, sometimes it, it, sometimes it feels so sensationalized. Yeah. I just love to be able to hear kind of you're working on the front lines and, you know, obviously this is such a time where we need to appreciate those who are uh, in the medical profession, whether they're doctors, nurses, pharmacists, what, who are working in and literally giving themselves to fighting this pandemic. But, uh, I'm sure folks just would be interested and curious to know, uh, like, what's Josh's perspective on this? Like, you're kind of living in the thick of it, and you are literally on the front lines, um, downstream and upstream. What's what's kind of your perspective and kind of take on uh, what you're seeing and what's happening? Yeah. Um, so same kind of disclaimer, this is my view, right? Definitely not those of my employer and other people. Um, I, I think that... Um, I have a very unique view, as you've highlighted, you know, uh, because of the job that I have. There are a couple of things that jump out to me. The first is how little we still know and uh, about, about the virus and the disease. And that certainly, um, that's certainly impressed upon me whenever um, I, I talk to or am um, thinking about frontline clinical work. Um, you know, we think we know certain things about the virus. And I think what we know is pretty solid, but it's still new for all of us. It's still new. And so, you know, maybe you see that in news headlines, but I'll tell you kind of in um, hearing what clinicians are going through day to day, take care of these people. There are lots of unknowns and lots of certainty. Now, I do not mean to say that should, that should you know, trigger panic and mass hysteria. Uh, it, it's actually the opposite. I think it should, it should trigger kind of really double down on what we know is right. And maybe we'll talk about that in a second but then hold loosely the things we don't and just allow degrees of freedom for us to be wrong or to have to reposition a little bit. Uh, and if that's okay. Um, right. And so, uh, what, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, when you think about does the distancing, do these shutdowns really work? Right. I think there's actually pretty good evidence that they do work. Uh, the problem is that the downstream effects of that, um, are also, we don't know what those are and they can be pretty big. And so being very firm about, Hey, you should wash your hands and you should kind of probably stay away from people. Uh, But when we lift these things, we don't quite know what will happen from them. I think is like, that's what I'm talking about. To be able to hold those two is really important. And I'm talking about that on a societal level. When we take care of patients, the same thing, we know X, Y, Z things about how the virus um, behaves. We don't know other things. And to be able to do that, I think is really important. So I think the biggest perspective from me, from my perspective is, um, just being respectful of uncertainty um, without letting it kind of get sensationalized one way or the other. That's good. Now you, um, you wrote kind of this mini series and I don't know, folks maybe in the church might've seen it. Um, but um, maybe talk a little bit about that. So I think you had what, four or five different installments. I think I have the name of, of, um, 
what you call it. You called it a COVID critics guide. And uh, I think there's just kind of a labor of love. You just kind of put this out there, information out there. But maybe just talk about, because I think that's just such an awesome thing too, right? Like outside of all the work that you're doing already, um, you just kind of have this idea to, to put some information out. Maybe talk about some of the, the motivation, the impetus behind that, and kind of what was the, uh, what was kind of the hope of what, you're, uh, what you were hoping or wanting people to kind of glean from uh, these different articles that you were writing. Yeah. So I, it, it, um, I think, as you, as you said, definitely midnight oil was burned to, to write that. Uh, meaning, you know, this is definitely outside the scope of the hats that I described and um, my marriage and, and, and being a parent. But, um, but it, as I say in the series, it really is uh, because I feel a responsibility to give pen and cause to this um, to, and, and to the common good. Um, but not just because I'm like a citizen in the world, but also because of all the things that make me who I am now, right? The people and the opportunities and experiences that have molded me, the training, the education that have given me a certain view on certain things. I'm able to say things that I think other people may not be able to say. By the way, there are many things I'm not well positioned to say that I shouldn't say, and I hope someone else will stand up and say those things, right? Uh, but to honor that, I think, um, and to do what I can in this way through a series, I think is really important to me. Yeah. The, the, the reason I called it the COVID critics guide is because, as we said, we've never seen this before. And so there's a well-known psychological phenomenon where it's, it's like recency bias, you know, like, ah, I've seen food before. I've had a virus before. Like, this is, I've seen this. Like, we have never seen this. Yeah. And so, and if, you know, school closures and cancellations a world over I help right. communicate that point. Right. And so my, my, my point is that we are always going to disagree with people on certain things. And that's okay. It can be very healthy. In fact, I don't know one person that I completely agree with on everything. And, um, and so I think sometimes it's easy to dismiss, oh, well, that piece of information is not from a source that I like, it's not from a news source that I read, or a, a body or entity that I trust. So eh, I'm going to nix that. Yeah. I think before we dismiss that, it's always good to kind of grapple with a little bit, because most people have reasons they believe what they believe. And um, one cannot convince someone, I think, out of something they were never convinced into, right? right. So I think oftentimes I hear people kind of talking past each other, um, you know, me with my facts, you with your facts, and both have reasons, and I could just connect them a little bit. And so I decided to do that. I decided to basically take a critic's view and say, if I really wanted to be critical about why are we doing all this stuff? Mm -hmm. What are the questions that would bubble up here? And then to take a very honest view and to do kind of to do work grappling with those questions. Um, and what I hope is that what's come out of that is a, I, I'd like to hope a balanced view, right? Then in some of those cases, the critic's view is, is founded. You should respect that. And yeah. in some cases, um, they're wrong, you know, and that's okay. That's all right. And so that, that's the hope. Uh, that was the motivation and the hope in that. Right. The, the last thing I'll say is that um, what I did not want to put a lot of uh, into the pieces was facts uh, because it's always changing. I just got done saying how little we know. There's yeah. always refreshing numbers. So the point is not to impart to readers, uh, it's 10% is this rate, or it's 50 cases. That will change. And there are other sources to do that. The point is to give a, a set of goggles, perhaps a perspective. And if you take that perspective, you can better navigate the coming month, the coming two months, the coming summer. Um, and so that whatever facts emerge, you can plug in, ah, this is the scaffolding about how I should think about this whole thing. Mm -hmm. And then I can process the data on my own. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was really the goal, to overcome some bias, to respect and honor a critic's view, whatever that means for someone, and then to give kind of a, a framework for people um, to approach the coming weeks and months, and I think it'll at least be that, yeah. um, rather than impart facts. That's yeah. the motivation behind it. Yeah, that's so good. That's so good. Um, and what I appreciated, you know, looking at reading through those articles, too, is, is you're just hold, you're holding the tension, right? that these are complex issues. And I think so often we just want easy answers, right? Like what's the solution? Uh, and I, I even think sometimes with faith, right? And in the church, that's kind of what we want. But what I so appreciate about how you kind of engage with this is kind of this critical mindset of like, hey, let, let, let's think thoroughly about the things that we have. And um, there's not always simple answers. And sometimes that's hard for people to sit with, but at the end of the day, when you're dealing with complex issues, whether they're, you know, a health pandemic or societal issues, uh, that there's obviously just so many different complexities that, that go into it. One of the complexities that you talk about is that whole, the whole kind of flattening the curve. I'm just super, sure. everyone's talking about that. I, I, like, I, I just want you maybe just spend a few minutes kind of talking about sure. it. Because one of the things you, you mentioned was that was so striking 
was, you know, this whole idea of like, it makes sense to flatten the curve, but then when you flatten the curve, you also widen it. And so there's all these other implications to having school closures and closing down businesses and everyone staying at home. Um, and so you've really thought through just the, the different implications. Um, one of the things that you talked about is not everyone's going to be affected by this. Uh, and certainly young folks, maybe, which is partly why maybe a lot of young folks aren't even really concerned. But one of the things that you did talk about, though, was uh, this idea of, of altruism, right, which I think goes back to even thinking about the common good. So as we're thinking about flattening the curve, why we should care, why we should be responsible citizens, um, I don't know, maybe kind of talk about that a little bit and like how that fits into this idea of we're, if we're going to be faithful Christians, how do we think about these actions in light of kind of the common good? Yeah. So I, I uh, appreciate that question. And I would take a half step back and say that, um, you know, there's always inevitably, I, I, in my view, a human one of the tensions of kind of our condition is that if you want to get a message out there broadcast broadly, you have to streamline it. Like just imagine the last 10 minutes of our conversation. You can't tweet it. It's way too long for that. Right? <laughs> you can't drop it in like a, you know, a TikTok. It's very hard to do that. And so yeah. uh, the question is, can I simplify a message and retain the good bits of it, the key parts? Or are some things just not, they cannot be put in that, in that packaging. So don't try to do that. And I think the answer is with all things is it's somewhere in the middle. Some things you can absolutely scope it down and say, you may not be an, an epidemiologist and infectious disease expert, but staying away from people for this period of time and washing your hands is good. You can definitely get that out there. But there's all that complexity that is harder and in my own view, next to impossible to kind of put down in 140 characters. Yeah. So I don't try to do that. You know, I think uh, a four or five part miniseries is what's needed there. And so I think that's true of the church. I think it's true of our private lives of public health epidemics, all of it. Yeah. Um, when I think about flattening the curve, I, I think one of the things that has to be acknowledged is that we are talking about avoiding overtaxing the healthcare system, right? We're not talking about overtaxing police force. We're not talking about economic growth. We're not talking about GDP. We're talking about getting that curve flat enough to where we don't overload hospitals. Now, easy case for me to make, cause I work in those hospitals and I'm a healthcare person, but, Critic or not, you have to acknowledge that fact. That is what we're talking about. And I think for lack of acknowledgement, some people are really skeptical mm. right? because people who are small business owners who are like, I'm very low risk for getting this. Right. My cash on hand is going down. Like I cannot survive this, turn the business back on. Yeah. Whether we agree with it or not, I think we have to just acknowledge when we say that we are talking about not overtaxing the healthcare system mm. because if we do that, we tip a set of dominoes. And that dominoes is when that set of dominoes gets tipped, and we're overwhelmed, then we can't take care of heart attacks or strokes or pneumonias anymore, right? right? Garden variety, we can't do that anymore. And those people can't work and those people could die. And taking care of those people might draw other people out of the workforce. There's a whole line of thinking there. Yeah. But I acknowledge in my pieces, I try to acknowledge that that has to be balanced against, you know, tanking the, 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 the stock market and draining people's savings and retirement funds. There's no easy answer here. Yeah. Um, but, but I think thinking through three or four implications, I think is really key. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean here if for all of us that you know, may not be affected? I, I think two things, and I, and I make this point, so I'll be brief here um, in, in my pieces, but um, I think the first is that this is a moral argument, right? To, to, to act a certain way for the betterment of other people that may not be you. Yeah. And whether you come to that through a spiritual sense or a cultural ethnic sense or mm -hmm. some other personal reason, I think um, if you believe, if you believe the value of doing something that's right for the common good, that yeah. that's your responsibility, then, then to me, doing your part to flatten the curve or whatever you want to call it is really important. Right. The other thing we talked about is very unknown, um, you know, what we know about the virus. So before we go drawing lines and saying, well, I'm not at risk are you? I, I don't really know. You know, so I think that's just a secondary reason to do that. But certainly this whole flatten the curve issue mediated through a focus on healthcare really is, I think, talking about um, the public and the common good. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's so good. That's good. Um, what would you say, maybe kind of shifting gears a little bit now, um, obviously as a theologian and a, a person of faith, that's informing kind of everything that you do, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what, what's some encouragement that you would have for, I think one of the questions that a lot of us are asking, even myself, right, as a pastor, uh, like, what is it in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of what's happening, um, 
and the limitations and the constraints now, right, that we have, um, what does it look like to be church for the common good in this season? So let's say we're not a doctor. Let's say we're not doing what you're doing, Josh, where we get to literally save lives, right? Or we're not dealing with healthcare systems and structures that are hopefully going to allow people to, uh, to get the care that they need. Um, as you just think about the church as a whole, people in our community, people around our community, um, I don't know, what are some of your thoughts, recommendations, ideas as to what does it look like to, to, to work for the common good in a time like this as a believer, as a faith person? Yeah. Um, well, I think, um, I think my, my encouragement, my thought would just be one thing. And it's very simple, which is that I think I would, I think it's hard to imagine someone who has nothing to give in this time. One of the things that I really find I'm disappointed by, and I frankly don't know how it got to be. So was the, um, when we started saying things like flatten the curve, stay at home, physical distancing, social distancing, yeah. uh, is somehow that got warped into this idea of like, just stay at home and watch Netflix and try not to gain too much weight. Right. And, and you should hear me clearly, not being a disease vector, you know, is like really good for sure. <laughs> but I, you know, for me personally, it's not aspirational. It is not giving to the common good. It is not like what we aspire to be. It is like, uh, let's not make the situation worse. Right. Yeah. And, and we think about, is that really enough being at home and Netflixing? My, my encouragement and my kind of nudge would be no, probably. Um, and most of us are not going to be like me, right? Walking toward danger and assuming the risk of being affected or bringing it home. Those are real things. There's a palpable anxiety among physicians, but most of us aren't that. And that's great. That's no, there's no problem with that. But what are the skills and the knowledge and the things that you can do, right? And my, my guess is that if we thought hard enough about it, there's at least one or two things. So here's one thing that, it, that it's been something that's top of mind for me, for other people is even in the age of social distancing, mm-hmm. uh, checking in on the people that you know are vulnerable, that have chronic diseases, that are older, and that don't have family in the area, dropping off groceries at their door, um, picking up to the degree you can, extra toilet paper for them, those types of things. Yep. You know, going out of your way to um, uh, c- connect with them through kind of digital media. Those are things that I think all of us can do. On top of that, you know, whatever your vocation is, there's probably some cause, right? That is, that is um, aligning around fighting this thing. Right. And, um, and I think that if all of us just thought critically about what are those one or two things I can do each week, yeah. right? To not do less, don't go out, don't do this, but what are you doing? Yeah. I, think, um, I think we would all be better off for it. And I think it would be a great kind of um, testimony to kind of the idea of the common good. Yeah, that's so good. That's awesome. Well, hey, we're running out of time. And um, man, I'd love to continue this conversation. <laughs> Uh, But as we kind of wrap it up, uh, maybe just some parting words for those that are listening. A lot of folks perhaps um, maybe haven't fully discovered their vocational calling yet. Um, Maybe they're they're still wrestling with uh, their nine to five and does this even matter? Does, am I helping people? Am I, I, am I, I'm not saving lives, right? Like, I don't know what, what's some of your encouragement? Like, obviously there was a journey for you to get to where you are, uh, to be doing the things that you're doing and to com- be contributing in the ways that you're contributing. Um, what are, what do you have any kind of encouragement advice for those that are still perhaps in process on the journey, um, as to how they can be thinking about kind of their calling, their vocation purpose. And certainly yeah, I might want to use them to, to be a part of, of working for the common good. Um, you know, we all do this thing once, right? So sample size of one here, but um, if I can reflect on a few things, maybe, maybe three things. Uh, the first is that I think um, recognizing that all of us in every season have a role to play and that's not always apparent. I'll try to tie all these back to COVID because it's just front of mind for me. Yeah. If you think about like what we have learned from COVID is that, you know, we saw the numbers, right? It's two people, five people are like, come on. You know, right. two people, five people a minute, 10,000, 20,000, 80,000, right? And it just goes. It reminds you a bit of like kind of the domino effect, the exponential effect, yeah. um, the butterfly effect of things, if I can call it that. And so I think always being mindful of that, um, even in what I do, what I do each day may not itself, you know, lead to great, amazing things. But, you know, over time, you never know what that effect is going to be. And so I think just really like pausing on that, right? Uh, that that extra word, that, that extra hour spent volunteering somewhere, doing this thing. Um, I think it's really important and you cannot always see it. And if, if there's anything to show us that we don't always see the effects of it, um, again, once in a century global pandemic, right? I think it's got to be that. So I think that's number one. Uh, number two is that, um, you know, different things I think will happen in different seasons. 
I didn't actually always know I wanted to do this. And frankly, you know, especially if you ask my wife and others, you'll know, like I changed my mind many times, you know, and I was hard on myself early on about that. And over time, I, I began to give myself more like leniency and grace about it. Um, but all of that is part of the path to figuring out what you ultimately end up wanting to do. Right. Um, and I think I'm able to do what I do today well, because I tried on four or five different other hats, decided not to take them on. Yeah. So we don't know what each season is for. And I would, I, I would encourage people to not try to put too much into it. Right. Um, but the reassurance for me is that no matter if this is the thing I'm going to do forever, or it's the thing on my way to the thing, um, very little is lost here that it's very valuable. So that, I think that's the second. That's good. And then the third is just how much we, we don't know about things, you know, like, um, again, I told you about the kind of palpable anxiety among doctors and COVID. And part of that is to say, you know, there are some doctors that are actually checking their wills. You know, they're writing goodbye letters to their kids. I mean, it's no joke, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there are doctors that are sick now, getting intubated. When you think about not a day at the office anymore, when you think about it that way, you don't want to sensationalize it, but it makes you really put things in perspective. And the reason I say that is that um, the advice I would give would then be, you know, whether we think we know what we want to do or not, you don't know what's beyond the next horizon. That's easy to say, hard to do. It's cheesy, but it was true right before it was cheesy. Um, that that if you if you live in the present and do the thing you can do now, nice. that's all you can really hope for. Um, and and so I think all of that is to say, be in the present, recognize that what you're doing now is very little of it's wasted ultimately, and um, that you can have impact whether you're realizing you have impact or not. Nice. Um, and the, the beauty of that view is like you don't need to know what's going to be coming in five years. Right. You know, and if I've learned anything, it's that you think, you know, and then life blows it up. So it all those are my thoughts there. Yeah. yeah. Right. So live in, the, live in the moment for sure. That's right. That's right. Okay. Man, Josh, this was awesome. I, I'm so encouraged. Uh, again, just thank you so much for, I know you're, you're super busy and uh, I appreciate you just taking the time just to, to spend it with us and uh, just to share your heart, uh, your life, your story and uh, your, your wisdom and your insight with us. So, uh, thank you again. I'll make sure uh, that we'll share out those links um, to the articles too. So if anybody wants Great. to follow up and read up on those, then uh, we'll make sure that uh, folks can uh, get their hands awesome. on them. So yeah, awesome. thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey, for those that are uh, still listening in, uh, thank you so much again just for tuning in. Uh, I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're blessed. Uh, I hope you're inspired uh, to take to heart some of the things that Josh shared and um, not only in terms of what it looks like right now for us as a community, as a church, um, as individuals to, to work for the common good in light of what's happening uh, with uh, our world and current circumstances and situations, but uh, hopefully there'll be some nuggets in here that'll encourage you to think about just your own life and uh, what does it look like to be faithful to the things that God has given to you and instilled in you right now and um, how can uh, you uh, learn how to, to, to utilize those things to uh, be a part of what, whatever it is that God wants to do in and through your life. So, um, hey, if you enjoyed uh, today's episode, I uh, encourage you to like it, share it, comment on it, um, give it to a friend, all the other things that you would do on social media. Um, we're going to continue to hopefully uh, give you uh, new content every month. And so uh, look out for the next one. Uh, but uh, for the time being, uh, we love you. Uh, stay safe, stay home, uh, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you again real soon. God bless.